I invite you to stand with me and turn to the eighth chapter of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as recorded by Dr. Luke. Luke chapter 8. chapter 8, and I would like to begin reading with verse 26, a familiar passage to some, Luke chapter 8, verse 26. Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time, and he wore no clothes nor did he live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. We had often seized him, and he, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, said, what is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now I heard of many swine who were feeding down the mountain, and they begged him that he would permit them to enter them, and he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man, entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. When those who fed saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they also met seen and told them by what means he who had been demonized or demon possessed was healed, then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the gatherings called him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. And he got up into the boat and returned. Now the man from whom the demons had been departed begged him that he might be with him. Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. May the Lord's richest blessing be upon his word and be sanctified in our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word. When it looms our hearts and our minds, it gives light. And now we pray that you would speak to us. From the old book that we might behold glorious, mighty, splendid, and magnificent truth. Speak to every man, woman, boy, and girl that sound my voice. To the end, the lost might realize the need to be saved. That backsliders might be reclaimed. That saints might be revived. And that the people of God might be lightened. To see you in all of your majesty, splendor, and glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to speak to you this morning from the subject of showdown in the graveyard. Showdown in the graveyard. I remember when I was growing up, there was this man in my little community, and he had some mental retardation, but he was just a jolly fellow. And uh, he would walk several miles from my little town to Mount Hope all the way to Greentown, which is next door to Oak Hill, and that's about almost seven miles to Greentown. And he would walk to go to a funeral. Uh, the funeral home was there in Greentown. Richie and Johnson had a place in Greentown and one in Beckley. And George Edward would walk just to go to a funeral. 
And his caregiver would often say, George Eddie loves funerals, and he's crazy about the dead. And I don't understand his infatuation with funerals and with the dead. But as I got to know him better, and as I observed him, I, I found something out. That even though George Ed had some mental retardation, he had a great love for the Lord. And one of the reasons that he had such an infatuation with funerals, number one, is that he really loved to hear the word of God. And he expected for there to be a good sermon at every funeral. And secondly, he had figured something else out. With almost every good funeral, there is a good meal that follows. <laughs> and so I figured out his MO. He loved the Word of God. He also loved the fried chicken and potato salad all from Father, the funerals. I never, I had a great affection for him. And we actually became somewhat friends. I couldn't hang with him, though, with the funeral deal. Nor could I hang with him as he would always go to the graveyard to assist the pallbearers as they were placing the body there. But I always had great respect for him because he had no fear of the dead, nor did he have any fear of graveyards. And what he often would tell me, he would say, there's nothing that dead people can do to you. He says, there's a lot ones that can do you bodily harm. <laughs> I said, well, Brother Joe and Dave, would go to the graveyard when I hear noise, even the dead, which can cause me to do bodily harm to myself. <laughs> There's something that's eerie about a graveyard. And even in our modern society, there's a psychological thing that those who own the cemeteries are doing. If you notice with the, the new modern cemeteries, that they normally do not have the big high tombstone. And there's a, there's a reason for that, a good reason for it. One reason for it is because it's, it's more difficult to maintain and to manicure the lawn with the, the big tombstone. The flat piece, you can run the lawn more right over it. It's a lot easier, a lot cheaper to maintain. But secondly, I got this from those who own graveyards. They said there's a psychological thing here. The people psychologically have been programmed when they think of a tombstone, big high, it's dead, it's mourning, it's grief. He said, but when you have the flat cornerstone pieces, it's almost like it's a nice, serene, almost like a golf course. And I said, brother, you can tell somebody at that. I'm not buying that. <laughs> a graveyard is still a graveyard. I'll grab the tombstone with it nicely. Man, there's something about a graveyard. It's not a place that living people want to spend much time. And that's why this text is so intriguing. It's the fact this man would make his abode or his home in a graveyard. But for, before you can get to the text in Luke chapter 8, you've got to back up to verse 22. And the first thing I want you to see, first of all, is this excursion. There was an excursion to get them to the graveyard. Jesus had been teaching. His popularity had grown. The masses were following him. And he was there by the Lake of Galilee. And just impromptu, he said to his disciples, uh, Let's go over to the other side. And so they grab a little boat, and they get in the boat, and they start their journey over to the other side. Jesus goes, and he lays them in the back of the little boat, and he takes a nap. So they start this excursion across the Lake of Galilee to go over to the other side, to the people where the, the gatherings were. They tell us that the Lake of Galilee is nestled between two mountain ranges. And the mountains create somewhat of a funnel. And so the wind comes and it's compressed inside of the mountains. And they said you can start out on the Lake of Galilee and it can be crystal clear. And all of a sudden, without warning, a storm can begin to rage. And the winds compressed by the mountain sides, bounce off the mountains, and then been directed to the Lake of Galilee, and it can create white water or choppy water. It can turn a nice, serene excursion into a turbulent experience. That seems to be what happened here. The Bible says that as they were sailing and Jesus was asleep, a windstorm came on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. In other words, they thought they were going to sink. That's the way it is sometimes when you serve God. 
You saw it off on a nice little excursion. You said, this is going to be great. We're going to go to sightseeing tour. We're going to witness, and people are going to hear the gospel, and they're going to believe, and they're going to get saved, and revival is going to break out in the land, and everything is going to be in the words of Reverend Joe Kashima Hunky Dory. <laughs> but right in the middle of the excursion, you often find yourself in a storm, an unplanned, unanticipated, unexpected storm where the winds are howling and they're blowing and they're beating upon your life. A couple of years ago, there was a movie. It was called The Perfect Storm. As a matter of fact, it was re-aired recently on TNT, where these fishermen were out and they were fishing. This is based, 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 based on a true story, even though it's manufactured for television and for the movie, but they get caught in this storm where three storms converge. And the meteorologist that is looking at it coming together, he says, wow, this is the perfect storm. Three storms coming together with the forces of the wind that would create and the size of the waves and so forth. And unfortunately, the fishermen did not make it back because they were in the perfect storm. Uh, that's an oxymoron, a perfect storm. Storms are something we think of as being destructive, not something that we want to celebrate. And the storms of life are not something we want to celebrate because they're real and they cause us to be in peril and in danger and in jeopardy. And there are times that we are worried about whether or not we're going to maintain our sanity in the storm. So in this little excursion, they thought it would be just something routine. They would get in the boat and they would go to the other side. But there's something about trying to live with God. Nothing is routine. Nothing is easy. Nothing is simple. There are complications. There are mitigating circumstances that cause us just the most routine thing to become complicated. And so in this excursion, they're in the boat, the water is beating in upon them, and they arise, and they run back to the back of the boat, and they wake Jesus up and say, Lord, what the world is wrong with you? I told you about this story. Some of you haven't heard it, but it's a true story. I was on this plane, and uh, I was very, very afraid to fly. And my job in a previous life caused me to fly a lot. And so I was able to overcome that fear of flying, particularly long as the sun was shining and the, the sky was crystal clear blue and all this type of business. And so I got on this one flight once, and I left Charleston, and, and it was beautiful. just like it is today. The sky was beautiful. And we're flying into Detroit. And we got caught in a storm. And we were on one of those little pencil planes. It looked like a pencil, you know. And we have been rocked to and fro all over the place, and this guy sitting across the aisle from me was asleep. He was asleep. And I mean, the plane would hit, and we would drop. It seemed like we were dropping for a mile, and your stomach would be left up at 25,000 feet. The rest of you would be down at 20. And this guy's asleep. And finally, I just reached over, and I just said, man, wake up. <laughs> I said, wake up and be a friend with the rest of us. That's what the disciples said to the Lord. Lord, wake up. What's wrong with you? This water's coming in on us. We're scared to death. I've got a harder stroke. As my daughter used to say, a harder stroke. And you're asleep. And there are times in our lives when the storms are raging in our lives and literally it appears all hell has broken out against us and we're like the disciples. It appears to us that Jesus is all asleep. Where is he? He's distant. He's removed. He's like the storage used to say. He's not involved in the daily issue that you're struggling with. It's as if you've got to struggle with them all by yourself. But I hear the Bible say that we have a high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's touched with the feeling of our infirmity. And so when we go through a storm, he's right there with us. He's right there with us in the midst of the storm. And he has all of this weathering apparatus and he can measure the speed and the intensity of the wind. He knows how powerful the waves are and he's able to protect us and take us safely to the other side. And so Jesus, he rises from his slumber in verse 25 and he says to them, where is your faith? And they said, Lord, you're talking about faith we're scared to death. And they mocked. And this is after, in verse 24, when he said, the wind and to the sea, peace, be still. And the theologian 
should say that when Jesus spoke those powerful words, the wind and the sea had to obey him, and the wind ceased. Not with a not subsiding over time, but it stopped instantly. And the waters laid down like a whipped puppy dog. And there was peace with tranquil on the sea. And the disciples looked at each other and said, what, what type of human being is this? What type of creature is this that even the, the, the winds and the sea obey him? What manner of man is this? And the same God who stood up in that little boat on the Lake of Galilee, and he spoke to the wind and to the sea and said, hush up and be quiet. The same God can rise up in your life and in mine. And he can say to the situation and the circumstance that are harassing us and that are howling all around us, he can cause them to be quiet and to be still. He can do it. He's lost no power or no authority. And so they get to the other side. But this is what's intriguing to me. Jesus risked the life of his disciples from their perspective. They didn't know exactly why they were going to the other side. They did not know why he initiated the excursion in the first place. They probably thought they were going to go on a retreat. You know, Christians are into retreating now. <laughs> you say something about retreat, you can get the, 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 the wagon filled. You say something about, let's go on another retreat. Let's go to another conference. Let's do it. Everybody ready to go. But you say, let's go and do witness for the Lord. Let's go out and serve the community. Oh, well, 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 Reverend, let me tell you, I, I got to do this. I got the doctor's appointment. We'll retreat and we'll eat at the drop of a hat. But when it comes to service and sacrifice and ministry, all of a sudden our calendars are full. Our day planners are overcrowded. And I'm sure they thought they were going to the other side for some rest and relaxation. But they get to the other side and they go to a graveyard. And I can hear these brothers. They were not filled with the Holy Spirit yet. You've got to understand. They did not get filled with the Holy Spirit and the, the day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit came. They were men and women just like us. And I can hear what in the world he brings us over here in the graveyard. But what is wrong with him? He has risk our lives out on the lake. We could have drowned. We could have went under. And now we're over here in the graveyard. And so when they got to the graveyard after the excursion, there was an encounter. There was an encounter. Verse 27 of Luke 8, Jesus steps out of the boat, and there met him a certain man from the city who had Demons for a long time and wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house but in the tomb. This is some sight to see. A wild man approaching you as you get out of the boat. Your heart is already beating 120 beats per minute. Your blood pressure is up. You're nervous. Your knees are knocking. You step out the boat. Here comes a wild man, butt naked, hair flying, looking a mess, wrapped up in chains, bleeding all over the place. And you say, so what in the world is on Jesus' mind? What's on his mind? You see, service to the Lord and ministry for Christ is always a risky business. You don't know what the next turn brings. You don't know what the next thing will, that will come your way. Now, I, I got to be honest with you because I'm a, I'm a truth seeker and, and try to be a truth teller. I'm not living time running home. I just want to answer the phone. My wife tell you, I just want to answer. I'll be sitting right there by, I just let it ring. I just let it ring. Let it ring. I like just let it ring. Because it's the thought of something else on the other end, unexpected, unanticipated. The thought sometimes causes your stomach to try to turn over a couple of times. That's the way life is. Some of you with, with your children. Your children, they, they drive, they go up driving, so when the phone rings, you're scared to ask. Get the call IDs. Call IDs, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse. <laughs> it's a blessing to me to dodge the bill collectors. That's a blessing. But it's a curse when you can know who it is, and sometimes you, you just got to ask. Even though you don't want to ask, you have to, you're forced to answer it by conscience. You know you have to ask. And you don't know what the outcome is going to be after the conversation. You don't know what the excursion with Jesus would bring. You don't know what the next encounter is going to be. But you take hope in that as long as you're walking with him, whatever you encounter and whatever you have to deal with, that the Lord has what it takes to deal with the situation. 
And so I'm sure when they saw this guy coming to them, they looked at each other. And they looked at him and said, Lord, what you going to do? So this guy who's demon possessed, he comes to Jesus and he's crying out, making a lot of noise. And look at verse 28. He falls down before the Lord with a loud voice and says, what do I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. I want you to look at this verse. I think this is interesting. I think what this demon, what these demons were trying to do is that they were trying to intimidate the people to conclude that Jesus was the problem. That he was the problem. That Jesus showing up was the problem. So let me tell you what happened. Very often people can accommodate to a situation an abnormal situation, and they live with the situation for so long, they think this is normal. Well, it's not normal. It's abnormal. It's not normal for a man to be running around naked in a graveyard, cutting himself. That's not normal. That is abnormal. But the people had gotten so accustomed to it and so comfortable with it, they were satisfied with it. And they did not even see any need to try to do something to deal with this situation. So when Jesus shows up, the demons recognize Jesus. James 2.19 says, you believe in God, you're doing extremely well. You're almost on the same level with the demons. The demons also believe, but they got such a tremble at the sound of the name of Jesus Christ. So the demons know who he is, and they recognize him, and they recognize his authority, and they know that God has set a date in which they are going to be judged. Matthew 25, 41, at the great day of judgment, when Jesus is separating the righteous from the unrighteous, he will say to the unrighteous, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, and to be cast into hell that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was made for the devils and his fallen angels. So they know that there's a date set in which they are going to be judged. And they tremble at the sound of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus shows up, because the devil is not omniscient, he doesn't know everything. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. He does not know exactly what's on God's prophetic calendar. So when Jesus shows up, God in human form, the demons conclude maybe our time of judgment has come. And so they fall at his feet, and they beg that he not torment them. Because he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for he had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bars and was driven by the demons into the wilderness. You see, in our enlightened society today, we've explained the way to God. There are seminaries, trained preachers, and Bible teachers, and telling them there's no such thing as a devil. That's just a figment of people's imagination. There is no literal Satan. There's no literal evil one who has a kingdom of darkness that does not exist. And so many people are coming to that erroneous conclusion. And so Satan's first strategy, the most effective strategy, is to convince Christians that he does not exist that he does not exist. And so in our enlightened society today, we don't talk about the presence of demonic spirits. We don't talk about the presence of evil spirits and the control that evil spirits have in the lives of individuals. And so people are not aware of the fact when they engage in activity that causes them to give up their own will when they participate in things where they're using mind-altering drugs, that that can open them up for demonic influence. Yeah. It can open them up to demon spirits because Satan is looking, he's looking for a beachhead, he's looking for access into the life of individuals. Yeah. And so when we, when our will are weakened, that's why James says, resist evil, resist the devil. It must be a conscious mindset of resistance. And so when our wills are weakened, people can be open to demonic possession. And so there are some things that cannot be explained in the natural. And we keep trying to explain them in the natural. So we look at some of the really perverted violence that's taking place in our society today. 
And we say, why would a person do that? And so we start wringing our hands and trying to figure out oh, well, why would they do that? And we start trying to do psychological profiles, and we start trying to do all that to try to figure out why they would do that. They would do that because they've been influenced by evil. Amen. And they may very well be possessed by demonic spirits, if not possessed, controlled, and influenced. And some things can only be explained by the demonic. Does that mean that we excuse people's perverted behavior because of the demonic experience? Absolutely not. Because individuals have a responsibility to seek God and to seek the truth so they might be fortified to be able to resist the demon spirits. But if they choose not to do that, they still have to be held accountable for their actions. And so this encounter in the graveyard, look at what happens. This demon, this man demonstrates, look at this, this man that, that is supposed to be mentally retarded, deranged, and I'm sure the people concluded that he had a mental problem. They would say he was a lunatic. In that culture, they believed that there was something to do with the moon, and the moon could uh, affect people's mindsets, and so they called them lunatics, luna from the moon. And so they were trying to explain his condition of being some mental uh, derangement, not a word of the fact of the presence of demonic spirits. So Jesus showed him, Jesus said, what is your name? Verse 30, what is your name? And he said, least because many demons had entered him, and they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss or to be chained up. Now there was a herd of swine feeding on the mountain and they begged him to let him go into the, the herd of swine. Let me tell you why I believe that Jesus allowed the demons to go into the swine. I believe the reason he allowed them to go into the herd of swine is so that the people that were there, the people that were witnessing this encounter with legion, they could see that there was some force that was controlling this man. And so when he allowed the demons to come out of the man, and he allowed the demons to go into the swine, the Bible says that the pigs then went crazy. And the pigs ran over the mountain, over into the sea, and they were drowned. And someone has said that pigs got more sense than a lot of folk. Pigs decided they didn't want to live with the demons. They were going to die in the sea than to be controlled by demons, influenced by demons. And there are many people who are, who are playing around and toying with things like the occult and like the Ouija board and tarot card reading. And then we have this, this emergence today of the black arts and it's sanctified and it's sanitized because it appears to be uh, just meaningless entertainment or recreation. And so we have the fortune tellers on television selling their services and so forth. This is all a part of the black arts. It's all a part of the occult. It's all a part of Satan's system of deception to get people to believe that I can gain access to wisdom and knowledge and understanding and direction for my life apart from God. Amen. Should the people not seek their God and not familiar spirits? Should the people not cry out to God? For the Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally. God will not hold it back if we ask in faith. And so Jesus Christ wanted these people in the gathering to see that your land is controlled by demons. And so he allows the demons to go into the swine, the swine that run off the mountain and are destroyed, mainly to get these people's attention through their economy. They now lost some of the livestock, and that meant they said, what in the world caused this, Jesus? But look at what happens. Verse 34, when those who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city, in the country. They stopped right there. So this excursion leads to this encounter, and the encounter results in an exorcism where Jesus exercises this legion, thousands of demons out of his land. And there are people that were there that were eyewitnesses to see what had happened. They didn't run to gossip what they had saw. 
Verse 25. They went out to see what had happened. The masses come back to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demon had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They were afraid. When they saw this man, who they had known as this deranged, insane maniac, now sitting there and clothed in his right mind, the Bible says they were afraid. Because they knew that a power had come to their country greater than anything they had ever saw before. And they also, who had seen and told them about what means he who had been demon possessed was healed, the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the gatherings asked him to depart from them. They did not ask the demon possessed man, the former demon possessed man, to leave. They asked Jesus to leave. They asked Jesus to leave, to depart from them. Now, what is this all about? What this is all about is that people love darkness rather than the light because the, the deeds are evil and the light exposes the deeds. These people came to a correct conclusion. If a person comes here and he has the power to give sanity of mind back to a deranged person, if he has the power over spirits, then he has the power to call us to repentance. So the people would rather live with demons rather than repent. They would rather live in a demon-infested land where people were running around naked and cutting themselves with knives and bleeding and doing all types of bizarre things rather than to change the lifestyle. Now don't be too hard. Don't be too hard on them until you first look at our culture. And until you first look at our society today, and you look at all the perversion that exists in the United States of America, this enlightened intelligentsia, supposedly the light of the world, you look at the violence that's in our country, if you look at the number of rapes and the number of, of the, the pedophiles, those who prey on children, when you look at those who participate in deviant behavior, yet still there are those who will say, we do not want God in the public sphere. We, do not, we will not have him to rule over us. We don't want him about the Ten Commandments. Don't say the name of Jesus. You can hardly hear the name of Jesus mentioned during primetime television hour unless it's on a religious station or unless it has been purchased by someone for religious purposes. The name has almost been excommunicated from the public arena. We don't want to hear that name. We don't want to hear about the Puritan hangups. We don't want to hear anything about that name. So even in our society, we are saying we will accept violence, we will accept perversion, we will accept the number of people who are on drugs and alcohol, people who are addicted, we will accept all this craziness, just don't give us Jesus. We don't want to hear nothing about Jesus. And so we end up with a secular society, a one who leaves God out, and a secular society ends up being a satanic society where there is satanic influences. Because where there is a vacuum of the truth of God and the presence of God and the word of God, then Satan will offer people what they want. And so we see today a generation of people with all types of problems that they don't want to turn to the Lord. They don't want to turn to God. They don't want to change the way they are living. They say, let me live the way I want to live. And then you do something to mitigate the consequences, but don't ask me to repent. Don't ask me to change. Don't ask me to think, to, to conclude that maybe it is the fact that I don't have God in my life, that is my problem. But that is the problem. And our nation's headed down a slippery slope. And our community is leading the slide because we're getting too good at all the wrong stuff. We're good at the wrong things. We're good at sin, and we're good at proliferating sin, and we're good at spreading sin, and we're good at immorality, but we're not good at righteousness. And the 
the song. But look at what Jesus does. Jesus believed that if you want to have it your way, then you can have it your way. The Bible said that he got into the boat and he went back to where he was. He got into the boat and he returned to where he was. Now what is the application here? The application here is that the gospel boat sets sails to every crook, every nook, to every village, to every place that the Lord Jesus Christ gives people an opportunity to see the truth and to hear the truth and respond to the truth. But once people have had, that, have had that opportunity, God is not obligated to stay there and keep begging people and pleading with people. Don't you want to be saved? Don't you want to go to heaven? You don't want to go to, devil with the, to go to hell with the devil. Please get saved. Please get saved. Please give your life to me. Heaven won't be the same if you're not there. That's just simply not the case. There's going to be a big party in heaven whether you are out there or not. The question will be, will we respond to the invitation and have our place reserved and will we show up? And so we must be pressing upon people that now is the time of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. You better respond to the gospel now. If you sense that you're lost today, if you sense the need to get saved today, if you feel guilt and shame today, if you want a better life today, you better get right with God today. Because if you don't do it today, Jesus might get back in his boat and go to the other side. And you may never feel that way again. You may never feel that way again. And you might be left to be controlled by the demons of darkness that are currently haunting and tormenting your soul. So the Bible says that he got in his boat and he left that place. But his mercy. This man who didn't have no sense and who never got a whole lot of sense. You know, I meet a lot of people who are not supposed to have no sense. And very often, they will be bought to talk with me by their parent or by their husband or wife. Somebody's supposed to have some sense. And then I look to the person who's supposed to have some sense, and they ain't got no sense. And then the person that's supposed to have no sense, they're talking and making all kind of sense. And I'm saying, we've got a role reversal here. A role reversal. So the man who wasn't supposed to have no sense, he now got all the sense in the world because he's realized that sin is what was making him insane. And sin is what makes us all insane. And all of y'all in here now, I know most of y'all are saved, y'all are sanctified, and y'all deal with the Holy Ghost, and y'all don't drink, smoke, or chew, and you don't run with girls or boys that do, and you can't even remember the last time that you said you're so saved. But for those of us who just got up out of the mud, and for those of us who still have the stench and the odor of sin, still in our garments. We remember the way it was. We remember the way it was and we know the grip and the clashes and how Satan had his hand on us and how we just didn't have no hope and we were just like this guy in the graveyard. Seemed like we were bound up and we were chained up and we wanted to do good, we couldn't do good because evil was there and the evil that we didn't want to do, we ended up doing and the thing that we swore, I will never do that again before we could get never out of our mouths. We felt the urge and the temptation to engage in it again. But something happened one day. Something happened one day. There was a gust that stirred and it came our way. And there was an encounter we had with the living God. And he looked at us and he said, what is your name? What is your name? Because God is a personal God. And God wants us to know that he knows each and every one of us by name. And he wants us to know that he'll pay a personal visitation to meet with us and to talk with us. And if necessary, he will chase us down all the way to the graveyard to find us. What is your name? You can't be no closer to death than when you were in the graveyard. This man was close to death and he didn't even know it. What is your name? Some of you have been to funerals and you've been to graveyards and you don't 
hungrily know that that was nothing more than God taking you on a field trip to show you where you was headed to give you an opportunity to give serious consideration to the state of your soul to prepare to meet your God. To prepare to meet your God. And there's never a time that I go to a graveyard, to a cemetery, to commit people to the grave. If the thought does not entertain my mind, if the next time I'm here, will I be the one that's being committed to the grave? I know that that's a real possibility. So I want to meet him. I want to meet him. And every time I go to a graveyard, I renew my commitment. Lord, I know you, and you know me, and we're on a good name basis. So for some reason, Lord, the next time I come here, I get committed to the ground. Remember my name. Remember on that great getting up morning when you call the dead out of the ground. Don't let me stay in the ground, Lord. Raise me up to be with you. And so the ex-crazy man say, Lord, I don't want to stay here with all these folks who got good sense. That's what he said. If I could paraphrase, Lord, let me go with you and your crazy disciples. Because these people here are supposed to have good sense. They're about to kill me. But the Lord said to him, no, you can't go. It's not because I don't want you to go. It's not because I can't use you in my program. But the reason that you can't go is because you need it here. You got to stay right here. Because these, good, these people here with good sense don't realize how sin sick and how sin crazy they are. And you're their only hope, one of their own, who I have saved and delivered and sanctified. I'm going to leave you right here. Then you go back home because maybe there's somebody in your house that when they remember how mixed up and how crazy you were, when they remember how deranged you were, when they see you in your right mind thinking sensible thoughts, articulating sensible ideas, when they see you living a change and transform life, maybe they will conclude if there is hope for Sam, there so must be hope for me. There so must be hope for me. God is in the business of exploding in a family and saving the person that is the most modern. Who saved the person that's the most on the edge. Now, if you are saved by the grace of God, you thank God and you praise him and you bless him. And you can only conclude that God saved you is probably because you were the nearest one to hell. You were the one who was the most messed up. And you might not even realize how messed up you were. But God saved you to give you hope and to give your family hope. There's hope for them. And so Jesus said, You're going back home. You've been the example. And see that this excursion God got us on, this excursion of taking us into villages and taking us to different places, hostile environment, dangerous, risky places, so we can encounter people that are held hostage by sin, and so that God himself can manifest himself in and through us, so we can show those who are bound, bound by sin, that when they encounter Christ in and through his people, there's an exorcism that's possible, that deliverance it's possible. And once the exorcism and deliverance have taken place, those people who were the ones that were bound, they can become the examples that God placed on his shoulder care. So the people can say, wow. Wow. What a God we serve. Wow. And there are a few, few people that I know I remember them on the other side of the cross. I remember how they used to live and how I used to live. And it's sort of like, you know, when you go see, see folk, and I told my wife this once, I said, you know, I'm going to stop saying, you go see somebody you haven't seen in a long time, and they've been through some things, and you don't, you don't gossip it, but you at least say it to people you're close to. Man, they sure look bad. <laughs> Man, they look bad. They sure look bad. And I told my wife, you know what? They probably said the same thing about me. Man, he sure look bad. This is the last time we saw him. He sure look bad. But every now and then, God will bring you cross folk. And you hear him talking about the Lord. And you see how they walk and serve the Lord. Wow, it got to be a God. There has to be a God somewhere. There has to be a God somewhere. 
And some of you don't realize that your mama and your daddy and your grandmama and your granddaddy, when they look at you, they say, wow. They got to be a God or something. That child show sure enough was crazy. Ain't have a look of sense. Pass the biscuits, please. But by the grace of God, one day God found someone. And they're clothed in the right mind. And been used by the living God. Well, the Lord is still in the business of creating showdown situations. Showdown situations. Jesus was a risk taker. I mean, he just took all kinds of risks and he just had total confidence and power and total confidence and faith in the power of the Father. And he knew that he was doing the Father's business, the Father wouldn't disappoint. So God brought some of you here today for a showdown with him. For a showdown with the sin that's in your life. And maybe you're not demon possessed. I'm not saying everybody who's saying is demon possessed. Don't go here and say the Reverend Watch say, I got a demon. Amen. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we're all, we are all involved in infected with the virus called sin. It makes us do crazy things. talk about how much sense we got. And God wants to bring us face to face with ourselves. And he wants to ask us, what is your name? Do you want to be saved? Do you want to be delivered? Do you want to be changed? Then I offer you that opportunity today. And that's why the Lord brought you on whatever excursion it took to get you here today. He brought you on this excursion so that you can encounter him and so that he can exercise out of your life whatever it is that's keeping you chained and chained and shackled and in bondage and fearful and anxious. He wants to deliver you from all of that so that you can become an example of his power and of his grace. Amen? Amen. Let's bow together, shall we? Every head bowed, every eye closed. If there's one here this morning, if you sense that God has spoken to you, you came here with a, with a heavy heart, came here feeling like you were in bondage, and you sensed that maybe God has spoken to you. If your excursion is taking you over just difficult places, and your life don't seem to be making any sense, maybe God is taking you through what he's taking you through to bring you to this place. Whether you can make a decision to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior to have your sins forgiven. Is there one here today who sense a need and have a desire to be saved? And what does that mean? It means you've come to the point where you realize that you are a sinner, that you've sinned against God, that you cannot change yourself. That you need God's forgiveness. And you desire God's forgiveness. If you're here today, just raise your hand right where you are. Raise your hand. I just want to be saved. God bless you, sir. I see that hand. Someone's going to come and talk to you. Is there another one? You want to be saved? You sense a desire to be saved? You want to draw close to the Lord? Is there one? If you have a desire to be saved, just raise your hand where you are. You want God's forgiveness. You want to experience his mercy, his grace. Is there another one? Just raise your hand right where you are. Is there anyone here that sense a need? Maybe recommit their life to Christ. Maybe you've already accepted the Lord. God bless you, sir. I see that hand. Is there someone else? Just sense a need to recommit your life to Christ. 
So just raise your hand right where you are. Raise your hand and recommit your life to Christ. You just pray this prayer right where you are. The Lord Jesus, you know where I am. And you know the condition that I'm in. I don't believe you saved or leave me right here. I just want to give you the reins of my life. I want to live for you. Forgive me of my past sin. If you have a spiritual need, you come to the altar of your life. As we're closing the word of prayer, you sense God is speaking to your heart, something burdened in your heart. Something too heavy for you to bear alone. Just come and bow before the altar and say, Lord, you're at. He's bringing his burden to you. Don't be ashamed to come to the altar. It's, just, it's, a, it's a marvelous place. make it to the other side. Just trying to make it to the other side. Sometimes our little boats seem swamped by the waves, driven like a cork in the sea by the winds and the storms. But we must always remember that the master of the sea is in the boat with us. His name is Jesus. Either he can keep us from capsizing, or he can speak to the wind and the seas to cease. Sometimes he does. He let the winds keep blowing and show up. He can still get us through. Brother 
daily lives to Father. Keep him strong. Encourage his heart. Strengthen his relationship with his children, Father. Protect and watch over them, Lord. Lift up Sister Sharon Gordon to you, Lord God. Pray for her, Lord. She continues to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Father. Keep her heart and courage. Lift up both Brittany to you, Lord God. Pray to strengthen her, Father. Keep her heart and her mind tender open to the things of the Lord. Lift up brother and sister Burke to you, Father. Pray to continue to knit them together, Father. Give them great joy in their marriage and their relationship. Give them great hope of better days to come. Father, lift up those who have been counseled, Father. I just pray for the counsel, Brother Ben Tolliver, Brother John Mitchell, Lord. Just pray to give them a good word. They might make the gospel plain and simple. Those who have been counseled, Lord, you open their hearts to receive good word of God. And I pray, Father, those with the sound of my voice, some who did not come to the altar, but their hearts are heavy. For man, born a woman, his days are full of trouble. And even your choice servants, Father, those who name the name of Christ, we're not exempt. Father, we do not have just an easy excursion into glory. We have storms and we have winds, we have adversity, we have obstacles, difficulties, hardship, Pain, but through it all, we learn to trust in Jesus. We learn to depend upon his holy and righteous name. We learn to trust in his unchanging word. So I pray, Lord, you speak a good word to your congregation today. Lift the spirit today. Pray today, Father, you just take away the anxiety and the frustration, Father. All the issues that they're dealing with, they got to face again on tomorrow. We give them today a respite, Lord God. They to refuel and recharge their spiritual battery and renewed hope that when I face problems tomorrow, I don't face them alone. I face them in the power of Almighty God. He's in the boat with me. And I'm going to trust him to rise up when he thinks he needs to rise up. To say peace be still when he thinks he needs to say peace be still. And I'm going to keep on striving. And I'm going to keep my oil in the gospel water. I'm going to keep on paddling and moving toward the celestial souls where trouble cease. Hard days will be over. But until then, I'm going to keep on serving the Lord. So we thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Bless your holy name. For your name is high above the heavens, Lord. Bless your holy name. The salvation know the name of the Lord Jesus. We thank you for that, Father. There's healing in the name of the Lord Jesus. I pray for those with physical ailments, Father. We know that you still can touch physical bodies and heal them, Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, there's spiritual healing in the name of Jesus. Lord, you can restore us from discouragement and depression and anxiety, Father. You can speak a good word in our hearts and say, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Don't be anxious or fretful or fearful about anything. But in everything in prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God. And the God of all peace and glory will keep your mind. So we thank you, Lord. Father, we pray for our young people, Lord. We hold them up to you, Lord. Keep them strong, Lord. Keep their hearts and minds tender toward the things of God. Keep whispering in their ear, Lord God. Remember the Lord you created in the days of your youth before the evil day comes. Thank you, Father. And we commit this church to you, Lord, the Grace Bible Church.